Um, on books is about a little over one quadrillion. The rest is off books. So it's really, it could be 350 trillion, it could be five, you know, 400 to 500 trillion. It's really hard to tell what's off books. But we know through the Bank, uh, bank of International Settlements what's on books is a little over one trillion. And they're still trying to cram that down. But at any rate, you know, 1,500 times, uh, or 5,000, excuse me, 5,000 times what it was in 2000. That's what, and that's, that's what, unfortunately, until I realized what was going on, I had a hand in building. And it wasn't until I sat down in what it was a meeting I had in the World Trade Center on, at Marsh McLennan, where Nancy died, in 1997, I got together with three three other top mathematicians to talk about the new trading platform. And I sat down and I said, you know, I have listened to, you know, I'm not a dumb guy. I, I understand a lot of math and technology. And I said, I've listened to every, I've listened to so many discussions up and down Wall Street and, and lower Manhattan downtown. And I said, I don't, I don't quite get these derivative things. What is this? And I said, you know, we were in a room where we just spent three hours covering the requirements for their trading platform, and my guys built the network that fed the data in and out of the trading platform. Okay, we were the network guys. These are the these are the mathematicians that designed the trading algorithms. And I said, could you just I go just pretend I'm I'm just you know I don't know anything about this business. And I said, just explain to me how. In simple terms, what is the? How do I assess the risk? How do I assess the yield? How do I under? I, I gave them the four basic criteria for. How do I understand what these <coughs> derivative things are and how they work and how I should view them for as an investment? Just give it to me simple and straight. You know, my rule as a as a as a as a chief engineer, as a senior systems engineer, my entire engineering career is. If somebody cannot explain either a problem or a solution to you in simple, easy to understand terms, they don't understand it themselves. Okay? And I don't care how big or how complex the network was, if we couldn't, if I couldn't sit down with my engineers and we couldn't break down the problem and the solutions into simple terms that, that, that you could explain to anybody on the street, we knew we didn't have a good system design and we didn't have a solution that would work. So I asked these three men, these three brilliant PhD mathematicians, you know, give it to me just simple. Just give me the simple basic. Here's my questions, four questions. Give me four, so how do I do, how do I look at these derivatives? Well, about half, we were, we were in between. We finished our work for the day, and I was waiting for everybody to pick up their stuff, and we were going to go hit one of the bars and have a few drinks and socialize a bit. So everybody was out gathering their stuff, whether I figured we'd have a 15-minute discussion here. Well, a half hour later, everybody's gathered back in the room again. They're all standing there with the coats and waiting to go. And we have filled up half the whiteboards again with boxes and equations. And, and, and these guys, and I just went, stop. You can't explain it. You don't know what, what, this, what these things really are about. You don't understand them. And that's when it hit me. Time to get out of town. I can't stop this. This is out of control already. Everybody and their brother is jumping on these technology platforms. And we see the result today. But then, when I talked to my relatives and friends and everybody and said, you better pay down your debts, better start buying some real hard assets, you know, what I call, what I came to call the four Gs, guns, gold, ground, and groceries. They said, you better, you better get things together because we got, there's bad times coming. And like I said, up until about 2007, well, Jeff was insane. For the few number of my friends and relatives that actually took the advice and started buying some, you know, when they could buy silver at four dollars and something an ounce, and they could buy gold at, at uh, two hundred and seventy-five to three hundred twenty-five dollars an ounce, and 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 most of them still never got it because they called me up in two thousand six and they said, "Hey, it's dropping in price again. Is the run over? Is it time to get out?" And I just go, "No, keep buying." <laughs> And then they, every time we go through a correction in the metals prices, well, do, do, are we get, should we get out now? I said, no, keep buying. And they go, well, we're losing money. I said, but you're gaining weight. <laughs> and they said, what? I said, you're gaining weight. Well, what is that? I go, I said, it's not what, it's not, the importance is not in the price. It's in the value. 
And at the end of the row, what's important is the value, not the price. And you know, I think there's only one of them that as of this last dump in, in the metals, kept their metal. And all I could do, you know, <coughs> all I get is constant email. Should I buy now or should I get out now? I'm going, this is not an investment, right? It's, it's protection. It is insurance. It is wealth protection. Now, I've been talking to some people about these subjects for more than a decade. After I gave up my business, I became extremely politically active, both in Colorado politics and, and doing some other things, because I, I realized that we had a very short span of time. Um, and I, and, and th this is the analysis I laid out in the book. Where did we come from? How did we get here? And why, is this, why are these things happening? And what can we do to fix it? That's basically what the book is about based on, on my 30 years of experience working deep in the bowels of the system in all these different areas to explain. So I can help people understand how we can get out of this. The people in this room, and I used, when I, had, when I used to go around the state working on Tabor issues in Douglas, um, and, I, and I, I've said this repeatedly over and over and over again, and it is absolutely true. How many people do you think that it took to get Tabor on the ballot in the past? Anybody have an idea? What, what we had for our core team in 92 to, to get Tabor passed? Working people Probably about or five. Uh, Working people. People that worked on the petition and, and, the, and the campaign. 20. Pretty close. We had total statewide of, of between paid um, signature gatherers and volunteers. Um, we had uh, we had about 35 people that were that gathered most of the majority. I mean, total there was probably maybe 100 people statewide, but you know the average person gathered 20 signatures of that. You know, most of them gathered 20, 30, 40 signatures and quit, right? And they moved on. The real poor people, both in the volunteers and the paid uh, category for Tabor, and then statewide. How many people think got ran the campaign and put it on the ballot, or I mean, got it finished on the ballot, ran the campaign, and and, and, and uh, got the vote out on election day? There's basically five people: Douglas, myself, and three other people statewide that got that did that did the majority of the campaign work. The people in this room could drive Western Slope politics, western slope issues, western, anything that you want to do, if you, if, if you really have committed your lives, your fortune, and your sacred honor to get them done. Now, I'm not saying that, the, every, the, that the, the 35 people or so in this room have to go out tomorrow. Then. The first thing to do, obviously, is you have to go, is go find two more, right? Because the best thing to do is not put the work all on five, 10, 15, or 20 people. The reason we're in the shape that we're in is because that's exactly what's happened. Now, that's never really been untrue in history. I mean, at the height of the revolution, you know, one of the things that's hard for people to understand is that in their own time, the founders were sitting exactly where we're sitting today. They were the, they were the small minority. They were the small, tireless, vocal minority that were trying to espouse issues. 30 to 40 percent of the country was was Tories, British sympathizers. Another 30 to 40 percent, they're just the mercantil they're just the mercantilists, the, the the merchant class, the the I don't care, I just want to stay out of the way and do my thing and be left alone, and I don't care if the king's running stuff or you guys want to run things over here, just leave me alone, leave me out. Okay, the same. Basically, it's the same. Is having is our fight what we have against the progressives who are the Tories of today, mm -hmm. um, and the large apathetic middle that sits between the, this tireless minority, that's just like the founders, and the apathetic majority in the rest of the population that does nothing and simply wants to. Oh, they're happy to collect the paycheck, go home, watch some, watch Saturday and Sunday sports, and and, and drink beer. Get your government check. And get a government check. Right? That's that's what we're that's what we're up against. But realize that that's no different than what the founders were up against. That's what they had to overcome. 
you know, you realize the small number of people we know about today, well, you know, the population of the 13 colonies at that time was three and a half, almost four million. Okay, so they were basically, you could take Colorado. Here's the group of the founders sitting in this room with five million people in the state, right? So it, the numbers are not as daunting as they seem. And the more, you'll find out that an educated, knowledgeable person is worth a hundred times the average drone in the population that doesn't give a damn, doesn't have any idea of what the republic is about, couldn't give, tell you how many articles there are in the Constitution or how many amendments, hasn't, hasn't even, you know, has never even glanced at the state constitution, which is actually a more important document. And that's, and, and so, and, and believe me, in, in the last 20 years, especially being attached with somebody like Douglas, um, I don't know how many, many people have actually met Douglas here personally. I'm sure we have, I know we have a number of them. But, you know, he's, he's a really <laughs> tough guy to work with. He, he's not nearly as pleasant and nice as me. <laughs> um, I mean, some people just outright call him an asshole. <laughs> and sometimes I have too. But, you know what, as he's, one of the, he's like a state treasurer. He is a state treasurer. Because right now we've got 13 lawsuits going. He's got his appeal going for his tax trial. And that's one thing I want to I impress on. When I speak anywhere in Colorado, having left here, I try and impress on people is don't ever be fooled by this, by this garbage. And this, because I went through, I had to go through it with him. I was under subpoena several times. I was forced to testify in front of the secret grand jury so they could hand down their indictment. They tried to get me to testify um, as a hostile witness for the state by by having him extradited from Idaho when his tax trial was going on last uh, last uh, summer or went, uh, winter and before they stuck him in jail. But realize this, the total amount that the state was able to document on, ta on Douglas for his tax evasion, quote unquote tax evasion, that they stuck him, that they fined him $53,000 for and stuck him in jail for six months. Well, he got out after 104 days. But sentenced him to six months, was $168.71. That was all the state was able to document. And that was crap because that was based on the advice of one of their own re uh, state revenue officers of the, of the Department of Revenue. Why that error? Why he even owed that much? He didn't owe anything. He didn't evade any taxes. And all the millions of dollars that they threw out there that was funneling through our quote unquote secret PACs and because I was I was chairman or president of our PACs and was uh, almost all of these transactions I was I was involved in. Um, all these that was all they could document. There was no there was no tax evasion, there was no tax fraud, there was no and when they when he, when his appeal comes through, <coughs> oh they're gonna eat it big time. There's forty seven there's forty seven different um, reversible major reversible discrepancies in the trial court procedure. If you don't think that was a sham trial, you're, you're sadly mistaken. That was the biggest sham this state has ever, has ever been witness to, and hardly anybody spoke up and said a damn thing while they were trying to railroad him into jail. Because the only thing they wanted out of that trial was the headline. Douglas Bruce, tax evader, goes to jail. Why? Because they wanted to destroy Tabor. Because according to the Independence Institute, Tabor has saved this, the taxpayers of this state since its inception, $13 billion at the state level alone. You realize what that, real, what that means in terms of future GDP? You have several tens of billions of dollars of state GDP that's directly responsible for the $13 billion that's been kept in Colorado taxpayers' pockets and, and been subject to the wealth effect and the multiplier effect by keeping that money in the private sector economy and available for, for investment. <clears throat> Think about that, what that means. I can tell you what it means because Idaho, when they pass, when we passed Tabor, I did a comparison, I did an analysis to Idaho. In, in 1992 when Tabor passed, Idaho and Colorado were almost identical <coughs> in per capita GDP, per capita income, and per capita state taxes, state and local taxes. 
Fast forward 20 years, okay? Idaho has no TABOR, and they have a very regressive local tax structure. And unlike most people's thinking that it's a very conservative state, when it comes to state and local taxes, they're, they're incredibly regressive and they're incredibly uh, uh, liberal thinking in local property and, and uh, sales taxes. Colorado now stands 38% higher in per capita GDP, 33% higher in per capita net income, <coughs> and it's 25% lower in per capita state tax, state and local taxes than Idaho without Tabor. You can normalize for everything else, and that's, that is almost the only things that can attribute the difference now in 20 years, in 20 years, a little over 20 years of Tabor. Is the fact that we had Tabor, we got Tabor in here and they don't have Tabor. And that's, you know, if people don't understand how economics works, they can just do that very simple study. And that's, that's adjusted for the difference in population. That's, that's on a per capita basis. Like I said, if you looked at the demographics, even though Colorado had about four times the population of Idaho then, that's about four times the population now. So it's an apples to apples comparison on a per capita basis. And there's no other real factor that account for it. Because everything else in their tax structures and everything was almost identical in, in 1992. So I cannot emphasize enough that when you hear this stuff and when you hear people talk about all that tax cheat Douglas Bruce and he's really not, you know. <laughs> if, if you don't believe me, got all the subpoenas, been under all the investigations, I was a little more than kind of happy to get out. I was always intending to go back to Idaho because I was raised in Idaho and in school there. I had always intended to go back to Idaho because I only had my business in Colorado for 20 some years while I was in business. I didn't run away to get to Idaho like a lot of people claimed out there. They kept, during his trial, they said, oh, he's hiding out somewhere in the wilds of Idaho. And we can't serve him a subpoena. Right? And of course, and it was the way they said it in the court transcript, you should read it, because he, yeah, it was, I was, I was like, he was trying to infer like I'd run up to Idaho and joined a militia group. And now he's running an area nations farm there somewhere in the panhandle. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's just incredible. But to realize how the, 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 you know, if people, people should have, and having worked the issues I have over the years, been subjected to all these investigations and subpoenas and everything, all I can tell you is, is that anybody that you hear that has any respect or faith in either the, the legal or judicial system uh, in, the, in, in the government, they should be just slapped around bodily and said, wake the hell up, okay? John Southers is a creep. He is a disgusting creep. He is the one that has directed this. We have a, we have, we, we cannot, we cannot get her to testify, but we have a witness. She's scared to death in his office who heard him say point blank, we're going to get them this time when they went after Douglas for his tax evasion charge. You think he's a Republican conservative? Believe me, he's a statist authoritarian thug. And I've known John Southers since he was a local, or a local attorney in Colorado Springs. He's always been the same devious little bastard that he is today. Okay? And, and if you understand, when you understand this about what's going on in our system, it makes it a whole lot better. You just have to stop from square one and say, look, we damn near have to start from scratch right at the local. We have to probably turn over at least 50% of the state, and we have got to 100% turn over the federal government. But, as I explain in the book, we're never going to do it until you start right here. Right here. You just forget about the federal government right now because it's gone. That, the analysis that I put in the book, I think, will pretty much convince you that the only way, we have one way and one way alone, and that's to start from the ground up. And that's what this presentation is about. How do we get from the ground up? I'm going to get this started here. Does anybody have any questions so far? Yes, sir. I have a question. Uh -huh. uh, you're locally. The uh, Great Junction City Council uses a fundamental uh, way to bring money into their with the public safety building they built in, the, the taxpayers twice rejected the money to the public safety building and they use the uh, certificates of participation. Mm -hmm. How can we hold them accountable when we 
twice we rejected that project and used the certificates for